Welcome to another episode of Burn Peak Express, and today we're doing something a little different because we're not at Burn Peak, but actually we're doing something kind of the same because we're riding bikes, and I'm here with Johnny. What's going on, guys? He's got his e-bike. Last time we set it up, we figured it all out in the rain, and since then, Johnny's had a little bit of time to ride it, figure it out, get to know it. So now we're at an actual bike park. We're at Ride Canuga here in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And this place isn't even open yet. I'm standing here with Nico, and some of you may remember him from Windrock. That was his last project. This is his latest project. Nico, tell us about it. Yeah, so we wanted to build something out here that was unique to Western North Carolina. We already have a bunch of awesome trails in this area, but this trail system is e-bike friendly. They're, all the trails are directional and mountain bike only, and we've got a progression from green all the way through to black with some jump trails that are purpose-built, so stuff here that you might not find out on the public trail system. So what trail would you recommend as a first for Johnny? He's a pretty adept mountain biker, but he doesn't really do jumps. I'd say we just start from the easiest one and work through up to wherever you stop, I guess. Yeah, so I guess let's get climbing. Okay, the pedal up is really easy. Lots of grade reversals, but I'm trying to keep up with these guys on e-bikes. It's not working out so hot. All right, I gotta be getting close. They've probably been up here for 10 minutes already. So today's a little different because we're just out having fun. We don't really know what to expect. We don't know what this park has in store. So we're gonna start by going down the intermediate trail, check it out, see how Johnny does on his big heavy e-bike. And I'm gonna follow Nico down and see what all the fun lines are. Oh my God. All right, so here we're at the top of the blue jump line, and this is where a kind of intermediate rider would be able to hit some jumps and progress a little bit. From what I understand, they're like kind of small A-line size jumps, so probably a little bigger than what you'd find on most blue jump trails, but they're gonna be intuitive, they're gonna be mellow, and they're gonna be awesome. So we're gonna go down here, see how I do, see how Alex does, and see how Johnny does. How you doing, Johnny? Good man. On my uh, roll around there. See me all the <laughs> Yeah. E bike would be nice right now. Dude, it feels so good. So, all over these trails, Nico knows all the lines. He built the place, plus, he's a professional mountain biker. So, he's just sending stuff. I don't know what's coming up, but still, these trails are intuitive. As long as you go in at trail speed, you can just hit everything, gap all the jumps. And You've never really hit any jumps whatsoever. How did you feel? I felt great. I mean, this is my first time riding a like, true jump course kind of thing like this, and everything's a table. The lips are in obviously amazing condition, and you know we've done it twice now, and I felt 10 times better on the second one, so I can just see how you could progress so quickly at a park like this. Oh, I cleared it! Yeah! So that jump line is fun for anybody of any skill level, but Johnny has never really hit jumps before, and he told me that he cleared the big step up. So we were out in front, we didn't see him, so we're gonna go back up so you can prove it. So as long as you let the trail dictate your speed, you're gonna be fine. Whoa, yeah! All right, did he clear it? Yes, but I think he can go a little deeper. So we're gonna go back up, Try and get Johnny a little more speed and see how he does. Well, I'm pretty sure I cleared it that time too, right? Oh yeah, but this is how you progress. Repetition. Johnny, how you doing on battery? 80%? Oh man, we've done so many laps too. And how about the fact that you're just talking oh, yeah, dude. like it's nothing right now and I'm dying. <laughs> this is our last run today on this. And then we're gonna go to the bottom and we're gonna hit something else. This is, this is it, it, man. You gotta t check this off or you're gonna have to wait till grand opening. Do it. Come on, boy. Let's do it. Come on. Johnny's going in. All right, get up a little more speed. It'll be fine. He just did that. That's do or die right there. When he has that much speed, you're either sending it or you're in big trouble. And he completely kept his composure. Holy crap. Dude, that felt great, right? 
good. In the woods. You must be walking on air right now. You see how smooth it feels when you land past the knuckle? Loading, man. Dude, I am so proud of you. So it's hot out, like southeast hot, humid, and you know, we've been doing laps and it's getting old. But Johnny, he hasn't even broken a sweat. So we were on the blue trails. That's like a little bit harder than the easy trails. Then there are the black trails, and the black trails are the ones with the really big jumps, all the really advanced features, and honestly, I'm not too stoked about riding that stuff today, but Nico, that's what he lives and breathes. I did not expect this place to have jumps this big, and that is awesome. There's room for progression, no matter what level you're at. So Nico, why is this called Big Brutus? The biggest excavator in the world is called Big Brutus. And this jump is two scoops of Big Brutus's bucket. So no That's insane. It? Shut up. <laughs> it filled three train cars with one scoop. Jesus. Well, I'm on YouTube, I watch. Excavating videos. <laughs> You're like Seth. You're like Seth. You guys are weird. <laughs> so we're really fortunate to be able to ride Canuga before it even opens. In a few weeks, it's going to be done, and there's going to be way more to ride. We're definitely going to come back. It was amazing. I mean, honestly, you know, starting off this morning, looking at a jump this big, I would have never thought I'd be even attempting it. So it. The progression here, I think, is just so dialed in. You know, I think if you've never done this kind of stuff before, you could start on the green in the morning and be at least rolling over the blacks by the end of the day. Well, one thing about a new bike is that the first time you ride it, you're gonna work things in. You're gonna loosen up the headset. You're gonna stretch out the gear cables. So we're gonna get this bike up in the stand. We're gonna check it out, see if it needs any sort of tune-up. Actually, you have any interest in hitting the airbag? <laughs> Hell no. All right. Thought I'd try. We're back from Ride Canuga. That place was really fun. I'm really happy to see how much they got done and I'm excited to see what's there when it finally opens. But in the meantime, we have a unique opportunity to show you how to service a bike after it's been broken in. And we'll start with Curtis's. Right off the bat, we can see that he hasn't even been using even close to all of his suspension travel. And with the type of riding that he's doing, we can let a little bit out and give him a much cushier ride. So we're gonna hook up this shock pump and in this case, we have about 95 PSI in it. I'm gonna reduce this to about 80. There's a little bleed valve right here on any shock pump, and if you press it, it lets out just a tiny, tiny bit of air. Every time you go for a ride, actually, you should take this ring and push it to the bottom. That way, at the end of your ride, you can see how much suspension travel you've used, and you can decide whether you want to add a little bit more air, take out some air, or even do some more advanced adjustments like adding volume tokens. Now, the rear suspension's a very different story. It looks like we have it perfect. The ring is almost to the very end, which means that Curtis is using pretty much all of his travel in there. Now we're gonna check over the rest of his bike. First things first, and this is something that happens to almost every bike once it breaks in, the headset. What happens after you've taken your bike out on a few rides is all the bearings really get pushed in, everything works in, and then it starts to feel a little bit loose. And the best way to check that is with the bike on the ground, grab the front brake and wiggle the bike back and forth. And if you feel any sort of play, which I do, it's time to tighten the headset. Another thing you can do is put your finger on the front brake and then put your fingers over the bearings here. Rock it back and forth and see if you can actually feel the bearing cup moving around, which I do very slightly here. Now, the good news is tightening a headset is a very routine repair and it's extremely easy to do. All you have to do is loosen the pinch bolts a little bit. <laughs> I've seen people take these all the way out. You don't need to do that. When you feel no resistance on the wrench, that's when you've done it enough. I'm gonna get this hex bolt right here and I'm just gonna tighten it down a little bit and then do the same test you did before. Hold on to the front brake and rock it back and forth. And if you don't hear any play, it's tight enough. And when you tighten those stem bolts, you should alternate from one to the other and just use firm pressure. So we're gonna get Curtis's bike up in the stand, check his gears out. But first, while we have Johnny's bike up here, we're gonna check out his headset too. Now, the reason I'm taking time out to show you guys this is if you got a new bike, I bet you you go out in your garage and your headset's loose. If you've taken on three or four rides, which Johnny has, things are going to work in and it's normal. Once you've tightened your headset, 
The bars should turn very freely and very smoothly. If they're like stuck, like barely moving, you've tightened it way too much and you gotta back off. So in looking at Johnny's suspension, it looks like the rear is pretty much dead on, just like Curtis's bike, but the front, he's been bottoming it out like crazy. I mean, this ring is all the way up to the top. So we might wanna get together with Johnny, have him sit down on the bike and see if we don't wanna add a little bit more air to it. He has been absolutely sending it. Now another thing you wanna check on any new bike that has any sort of cables, whether it's a brake cable shifting, is the tension of the cables. Yeah, a few of the gears are shifting a little bit rough. So watch right here. You see that, how it skips? To add a little bit of tension, all we have to do is go up to the shifter and there's this little barrel right here. And this little barrel controls the tension. Now, if you have to tighten it a lot, you should unbolt it from the back. But if you have to make little micro adjustments like this, we can just give the barrel, let's say a half turn. Now let's try that shifting again. Now it goes right up into those gears. Every gear is super smooth. So his cable just stretched out a little bit and it's a really easy fix, half turn on the barrel. All right, we have Curtis's bike up on the stand. Do a preliminary check. Make sure there's no play where there's not supposed to be. We know his headset is good. Let's try the shifting from the very bottom up. Uh-oh, looks like Curtis's dork disc came loose. These are required by law, but what I hate about them is that they're always cheap and crappy and they come off. <sighs> Should we remove it? Cut it off. Cut it off? Just rip it out of there. All right, Curtis wants it off, so that's what we're gonna do. So when you're taking the rear wheel off a bike, you wanna shift it into the smallest gear. This is a Shimano drivetrain, so from there, we're just gonna take the axle out and pull the rear wheel. First of all, if you shift into the smallest gear, it makes it so much easier to get back on and off. And then if you just grab onto the derailleur cage, bend it down and pull it back, it comes out super easy. I don't know why people have so much trouble with it. Again, these dork discs are required by law because if your chain gets caught in your spokes, it could cause your rear wheel to lock up and in that way it's a danger. So I can't recommend you take your dork disc off, but in my experience, they don't really do what they're supposed to do. There we go. It'll never make noise again. All right. Dork disc gone. Let's move on to the shifting. Okay, Curtis's shifting is not good right now. You can hear all sorts of clicking. Here I am at the bottom. I'm gonna go one click. Not shifting. Classic loose cable. Loosening this barrel tightens the cable because it's pulling it out and thereby adding more tension to it. So. I'm gonna go one half turn out, and then we're gonna try it again and see how it shifts. And as you can see, now it shifts perfectly. That one half turn of a barrel was all it needed. And again, that's pretty common because when a bike is brand new, it's got brand new cables. After you shift on it and pull on that cable a whole bunch of times, it stretches. After that first adjustment, usually it doesn't fall out of whack for a while. And of course, now that I service Johnny's bike, like any good mechanic, I have to give it a road test and make sure everything's working as expected. So pretty productive day. We took Johnny to his first jump park. He absolutely sent it on his e-bike. We got it back here, tuned it up, and everything's dandy. So generally our videos have a more cohesive theme, but today we just wanted an excuse to go out for a ride, take Johnny out on his e-bike, and check out Nico's new project, and it was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed watching, and if you want more videos like this, make sure you subscribe. Thanks for riding with me today. I'll see you next time.